Good morning. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We begin a new week here in New York where former President Trump is facing a deadline today to pay a more than $450 million bond in his civil fraud case in order to stop his assets from being targeted. Mr. Trump has said that he is challenging the judgment in the case and will take it to the Supreme Court if necessary. Those penalties against Mr. Trump and his company stem from a lawsuit brought by New York Attorney General Letitia James. After a months-long trial last month, a judge ordered Trump to pay more than $354 million in damages, a number that increased because of interest. Also scheduled for today, a hearing to set a trial start date in the criminal hush money case against the former president. Mr. Trump is expected to appear in court for that hearing, which is slated to start at 10 a.m. Eastern time. His motorcade arrived at Trump Tower overnight. Trial was originally actually supposed to get underway today, but the judge delayed the start date. By 30 days. Now, Trump is accused of falsifying business records in connection to $130,000 in alleged hush money payments that his former lawyer, Michael Cohen, made to adult film actress Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. Trump pleaded not guilty to the charges against him. Breaking it all down for us, we're joined by NBC News national correspondent Yasmin Vesugian in Lower Manhattan and NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos is here with us in studio. So, Yasmin, lots of New York-centered legal news. Let's start with you. That deadline the former president is facing today over paying the money owed in his civil fraud case. He says he has the money. That appears to contradict his lawyers last week. So where do things stand? What could we start seeing today? A, a big day, guys, um, this morning down here at 100 Center Street, where the former president uh, will be later on today when the trial begins around 10 a.m. I'm not sure if the news today is the press lineup and or what's going to be happening inside that courtroom. But let's talk first about um, the deadline when it comes to the $464 million in which the former president um, owes right now um, for that appeals bond. He says, as you said, um, has he has the money. That was Thursday night in which he put out two subsequent tweets in, in, in that he said he had $500 million and then said he had a lot of cash as well. His attorneys, though, saying he does not, in fact, have um, the money. The thing is, for the former president, True Social, Trump Media, is going to begin trading today publicly, Forbes estimating um, hit, that valuation could bring his... Um, his money up three billion dollars. So think about that. He could use his, for instance, shares in True Social and Trump Media as collateral if he wants to gain that five hundred million dollars in loans from either a wealthy donor and or a bank. He's going to have to seek permission from his board, though, to use those shares as collateral. But let me tell you who's on that board. One of which is his son. Donald Trump Jr., along with three former members of the Trump administration. So the likelihood that the board will say, yeah, go ahead and do that is fairly high. So we're going to be watching today because Tish James has already said that she would move to see some of his properties. Whether or not he comes up with that money today is really in question. But again, True Social hitting the market, trading publicly. Um, we'll mm -hmm. wait and see. Uh, Danny, we know the appeal here will make its way through state court. So what would the Supreme Court's options be if this ultimately did land there? They have no options, because if you're talking about the United States Supreme Court, there's really no way the Supreme Court could even take this case mm -hmm. on. There really isn't a jurisdictional hook. You can't appeal every case in every court up to the Supreme Court. You have to have a federal reason. Most often, that reason is based in the Constitution. If you're a criminal uh, defendant, for example, it's that your search and seizure rights have been violated, something along those lines. But you don't automatically have a right to go to the federal United States Supreme Court. In all likelihood, this is a case that involves purely state issues, and the most you can appeal it to is from the New York. Now, this is where it gets confusing. In the state of New York, the lowest trial court is actually called the Supreme Court. From there, you can go to the appellate division, and then from there, you can go to what's called the Court of Appeals. That is effectively New York's Supreme Court in that it's the highest court of the land. Will it go to the Court of Appeals? Likely. I think the Court of Appeals would take it up, even if the issues aren't novel, because it's Trump and mm. things change when it's Trump. But in all likelihood, that's as far as it will go. It will not make it to the United States Supreme Court. Mm. All right, Yasmin, let's talk about the hush money case. Manhattan District Attorney Alvin yeah. Bragg did not oppose the Trump legal team's request for that 30-day delay. Now we know Trump, he wants us to postpone 90 days. Bragg doesn't want it to go that long. What can we expect today? 
he, he wants this thing to go out the window altogether. That that's not going to happen. Um, today was supposed to be the, the the start of the trial day, jury selection, um, but because of that subsequent delay, likely today we're going to learn two things. First and foremost is the actual trial date. We'll get a trial date set today. The second is an explanation over why 170,000 documents were handed over to Trump's attorneys so late in the game, just in the last couple of weeks, by the way. So Morshawn wants really an explanation as to why that took place to then subsequently decide when this trial is going to uh, begin. And you walked folks through the delays and the motions to delay from Trump's um, attorneys. I think the other thing is um, Bragg and his attorneys are kind of making the argument that despite the fact that they handed over 170,000 um, documents to Trump's attorneys, really only 300 pages of those documents pertain to this actual case in which they should be able to read through those, go over those in the next subsequent couple of weeks to be able to start a trial within the next 20 days or so. So those are the two things we're going to be looking for. The arguments made by uh, DA Bragg's office as to why this happened, this delay happened, and then the trial date, guys. Danny, let's talk about some details about what we could see, you know, when this does actually get underway. So the judge presiding over the case, he had denied the former president's bid to try to prevent both Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen from taking the stand. Uh, but they, there are some restrictions here, especially when it comes to Daniels' testimony. How's that going to impact things? This is a rare glimpse into what are called motions in limine. These are motions that attorneys like me file in advance of a trial to pare down the issues. And ordinarily, you ask high and hope to get somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. I don't know that Trump's attorneys really thought there was a chance that they'd be able to preclude uh, Stormy Daniels or Michael Cohen, especially Michael Cohen. Mm -hmm. He is the star witness, in my view, of this Manhattan DA's case. So in all likelihood, they weren't going to preclude him completely from appearing. But what you can do instead is ask the judge to consider different areas of testimony that should not be entered into. And normally those have to do with either relevance or maybe they're too prejudicial or maybe they're redundant. So uh, there are some victories here for the Trump team. And you can win a lot of a criminal case in the motions in limine process, because if the judge excludes critical information from the case, then that, that jury is never going to hear that bad stuff. Mm. All right. Danny, Yasmin, thank you both for kicking us off this hour. We appreciate it. Well, this morning, four suspects are in custody and charged in connection with Friday's deadly terror attack on a concert hall in Moscow. At least 137 people are dead. Yesterday, Russia honored those who were killed with a day of mourning. NBC News international correspondent Matt Bradley has more. Moscow mourned. A rare silence over this city is after Russia endured its deadliest terror attack in 20 years. That's why we're with the country. We're together, said this mourner. The death toll rose again to 137, according to Russia's government, including three children. As emergency workers continued searching for more dead under the rubble of this vast concert hall, and investigators searched for clues. One survivor recounting the terrifying moments gunfire erupted, people trying to run for safety, and then seeing bodies on the ground. It was clear they had no signs of life. We realized then that there would be no hostage taking, he said. We had to do something, to run away, because it was somebody coming to kill. Two of the suspects were seen in a video released by Russian authorities as police transferred them to investigators. But more than 80 people are still missing. Among them, Igor Pogodiev's wife. I ran among the ambulances, searched among the crews and asked questions, he said, but I couldn't find anyone. Islamic State quickly claimed responsibility for Friday night's attack, a claim American intelligence backed up. The group even released a video showing the gunmen filming themselves as they maraud through the Kroka City Hall, hunting victims and shooting them at point-blank range. But Russian officials, including President Vladimir Putin, have repeatedly implicated Ukraine. America's government fears Putin will exploit the attacks as a pretext to rally support for his war in Ukraine. Matt Bradley, NBC News. Well, the U.N. is mourning that more people in Gaza could die from starvation after Israel said it would no longer allow food convoys from the U.N.'s 
Palestinian Refugee Agency to enter the northern part of the enclave. UNRWA, as it's known, is the largest aid group operating in Gaza. The head of the agency made the announcement yesterday in a post on X. He called the decision, quote, outrageous and called on the restrictions to be lifted and said many more people will die of hunger and dehydration. The worsening humanitarian situation comes as the United Nations Security Council prepares to vote again on a new ceasefire proposal. Well, the U.N. Secretary General says pressure is growing on Israel to halt its assault on Gaza. I see a growing consensus emerging international community to tell the Israelis that the ceasefire is needed. And I also see a growing consensus. I heard it in the U.S. I heard it from the European Union, not to mention, of course, the Muslim world. A growing consensus to tell clearly to the Israelis that uh, any ground invasion of Rafa could mean a catastrophic humanitarian disaster. Joining us now is NBC News international correspondent Raf Sanchez, as well as Hagar Shamali. She's the host of Oh My World on YouTube and the former NSC director for Syria and Lebanon. Good morning to you both. Raf, I will begin with you. So walk us through this decision by Israel to halt UNRWA's food convoys from entering northern Gaza. Remind us what happened there and then tell us the reaction to this kind of move and the impact it could have. Savannah, good morning. Yeah, UNRWA says the last time it was able to deliver food to northern Gaza was January 29th, so nearly two months ago. It says since then it has applied multiple times to the Israelis, to the military, to get that food up to northern Gaza. It has been denied each time without being given specific reasons. And they say they found out on Sunday from Israel there is now a blanket ban on any UNRWA food deliveries to the north of Gaza, despite that warning that famine is now looming there. UNRWA is saying this is only going to lead to more deaths. As you said, they are calling this outrageous. And they say this is making what is already a man-made crisis much, much worse. Now, UNRWA has been in the sights of the Israeli government for decades. There is no love lost between these institutions. Israel accuses UNRWA of perpetuating the Palestinian refugee problem rather than trying to solve it. And they have accused UNRWA employees of actually taking part in the October 7th attacks, crossing over into Israel, kidnapping hostages themselves. The Israeli government today is saying UNRWA is, quote, tainted with terrorism and saying that it needs to be dissolved. So they are not at all trying to hide that they are blocking this agency from delivering food. What you will hear from other humanitarian organizations is whatever animosity there is between Israel and UNRWA, UNRWA is the only show in town in Gaza. It is the only organization with the scale, with the capacity to address this crisis. And that if you cut UNRWA out of the equation, it is only going to lead to an already dire situation Situation, especially in northern Gaza, getting worse. Yeah. Guys. Hagar, let's bring you in here. The United Nations Security Council is expected to vote again today on another resolution that would call for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza for the remainder of Ramadan. Comes after the United States' own resolution was blocked. Will this one be any different? No, the United States is expected to veto the resolution today, which has been drafted by China and Russia. And the reason for that is that it does not at all mention the hostages. It doesn't ask for them to be released or demand that Hamas release them in exchange for this ceasefire. Um, and there's also another aspect to this, which is that the U.S., along with Egypt and Qatar, are continuing to mediate negotiations between Israel and Hamas on a six-week ceasefire. Uh, apparently, over the weekend, there had been some improvements made uh, or just, you you know, inches made closer on the agreement on how many of the 40 hostages that Hamas would release out of 130, how many of those 40 would be exchanged for Palestinian prisoners. Israel had agreed to the number, and now the, the, that, pro that proposal is in Hamas's lap, waiting for their response on it. And so the U.S. view is that if this resolution were to pass, it would undo all of that work, and Hamas would have no incentive to agree to that ceasefire. But either way, the U.S. will veto it. The problem with that is that it will only make the U.S. government look awful in this situation when they're actively trying to work on this other path. Mm. Raf, this is all happening alongside ongoing ceasefire talks, uh, as we've been discussing, part of this resolution, but also generally. We understand you do have an update for us there. What are you hearing? 
Yeah, Savannah, so the CIA director Bill Burns was in Qatar over the weekend. It's one of many, many trips he has made either to the Middle East or Europe to try to get these talks on track. As Agar was saying, it does sound like there has been some slight improvement over the weekend. I spoke to an Israeli official this morning. They say they are putting the chances of a deal in the near future at 50-50. Now, that is not super optimistic, but it is more positive than we were hearing from the Israelis the other week. They say at this point they are waiting for a formal Hamas response to a proposal that was hammered out with the help of the CIA director in Qatar over the weekend. I'll caution, we've been here many, many times before where the U.S., Israel, Egypt and Qatar are able to agree something amongst themselves. They send it to Hamas. It's a non-starter and we end up stuck as we've continued to be. Guys. And Hagar, you know, yesterday Vice President Kamala Harris appeared on ABC News and warned Israel against a ground offensive in Rafa. Let's hear more of what she said. Any major military operation in Rafa would be a huge mistake. Let me tell you something. I have studied the maps. There's nowhere for those folks to go. And we're looking at about a million and a half people in Rafa who are there because they were told to go there. Are you ruling out that there would be consequences from the United States? I am ruling out nothing. So, Hagar, if there were consequences from the U.S., what could those even be? Well, you have a few angles here. So from the U.S. side, when you have a situation like this where, where Israel may end up causing not just this humanitarian catastrophe, but one of the things Secretary Blinken was warning Netanyahu about was that this could have problems for decades to come and could create, could make this war a long insurgency, where you've basically driven these individuals, these, these civilians, into the arms of the enemy, and now they've, they're going to be taking up arms. The terrorists are the ones who are going to be welcoming them, causing a decades-long problem. And so what happens with that is that back in the U.S., you're not going to be able to have much control over how things are viewed on Capitol Hill, for example, when they appropriate foreign aid. They're likely to discuss, as are or they already are about making it conditional. That it's where it becomes tenuous. I don't think the friendship is going to go anywhere. But when you make that aid conditional and the U.S. is really the only friend standing left, it makes things very difficult for Israel's future. Hagar and Raf, thank you both very much. On the campaign trail, both President Biden and former President Trump are still on the path to a 2024 election rematch. They've already clinched their respective party nominations. And over the weekend, both nominees easily won the Louisiana primary elections. The president still waiting for the results of the Missouri primary, which should be released next week. NBC News senior national politics reporter Jonathan Allen joins us now. So, John, uh, Louisiana, does it tell us anything that we don't already know? I would desperately love to tell you that uh, pouring over the results of Louisiana, looking at maps all weekend, uh, that I could tell you something <laughs> prophetic uh, that came out of those numbers. But the truth is, no, uh, Joe Biden easily won the Democratic primary. Donald Trump easily won the Republican primary uh, with no real competition on either side. Uh, there's not much that you can extrapolate there. It was not a heavy turnout election. There are probably uh, 300,000 or so people that voted between the two sides. Uh, there are about 2 million people that vote in general elections in Louisiana. All right, John, I know you got something for us, maybe with swing voters, recent polling, giving us an in-depth look. Tell us uh, what we're seeing, but also remind us how critical some of these voters could be in this particular election, this rematch. Yeah, great question, Savannah. I mean, there were so many close uh, states in the last election and the last two elections. And really going back uh, to about 2000, we've had historically close elections in terms of electoral votes outside of maybe Barack Obama's re-election in I'm sorry, uh, first election in uh, 2008. So uh, swing voters are, are the um, the premium voters. Those are the ones that, the that particularly in swing states, uh, can really make the difference between who wins and loses the presidency. Um, you know, what we see from swing voters is uh, a lot of what we see is dissatisfaction with the two candidates. But, um, you know, right now, polling shows uh, broadly that Donald Trump is in the lead. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's part of that is swing voters having moved a little bit from where they were in 2000. John, while we have you, Wisconsin Congressman Mike Gallagher announced that he is resigning early. He's a Republican. He hasn't been afraid to criticize his own party. What impact could this have on Republicans in the House who have this narrow lead? Yeah, normally you would say uh, a congressman deciding that he was going to resign early instead of simply not seeking re-election, which is what he had said before, was not really a big deal. Uh, but the margins are so narrow in the House that when Gallagher leaves in April, uh, it will put the Republicans in a place where they can 
afford to lose only one vote on any uh, on any particular uh, measure that comes to the floor. Um, so if you're Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, uh, your <laughs> your uh, your margin for error just got cut in half, and as we've seen, it's very difficult for him to get anything done. Um, you know, as it stands. So uh, this is actually like much bigger news than it would normally be. Mm. All right, John, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Let's get you to weather now. The first weekend of spring felt like the height of winter for a lot of people across the country. Let's check on your morning news now weather with Michelle Grossman. Michelle, good morning. Good morning, guys. Yeah, we're seeing heavy snow in a lot of spots. Some spots saw more snow in this storm than they saw all winter long. So uh, we're looking at the northern plains, parts of the central plains, into the upper Midwest, looking at really heavy snow today. It's a big storm uh, extending all the way down to uh, the southern plains as well, the lower Mississippi Valley. On the warm side, we're looking at the chance of widespread rain. We're seeing that right now. We even seeing a couple of lightning strikes early this morning is later on today with that daytime heating where we're going to see the chance for some strong storms. That includes a chance of tornadoes. Back to the west, we have some snow falling in the Intermountain West. We have some snow and rain along the Pacific Northwest. We're looking at California, also Washington into Oregon, and the East Coast looking really good. It was so soggy over the weekend, especially Saturday, looking nice from New England all the way down to the southeast with lots of sunshine. So many people, millions under alerts this morning because that because of that storm system in the middle of the country. Twelve million under winter alerts. That's where you're seeing the white extending from the northern plains, the upper Midwest into the central plains. We have wind alerts for 67 million people. Could see some power outages as we go throughout this Monday. So it is a stormy Monday for many. Radar showing us how stormy it is. We see that blue. That is where the snow is falling. The lighter blue, the white color, that's where the heaviest snow is falling. Kind of sandwiched in the middle. You see a little purple there. That is sleet and also some freezing rain. And then on the warm side, we're looking at some really heavy rain. That's where you're seeing those darker colors. Here's that area of low pressure. It's a big storm in size, all stretching from the northern tier of the nation all the way to the southern tier of the nation. Intense snowfall, uh, one to two inches per hour. Could see some torrential rainfall as well. That could lead to some flooding, but we're also concerned about some strong tornadoes later on today. Tomorrow, we'll see that area of low pressure move off to the east. We'll see that snow slowly tapering off in the upper Midwest, coming to an end. And then we're looking at strong storms in the Ohio Valley and also the east central coast. Uh, Gulf Coast. And then by Wednesday, it's back to the umbrellas along the Gulf Coast. We're not looking or the East Coast. We're not looking at what we saw on Saturday, but still some wet weather, especially in parts of New England. You can see those brighter colors showing up. And then also parts of the Carolinas into the southeast. Widespread rainfall. It's excessive in some spots. That's going to lead to some flooding. And we're also looking at that severe weather threat as we go throughout the afternoon. Nine million people under the threat for severe storms, especially where you see the orange, Greenville, Jackson, Alexandria, Hattiesburg, looking at the chance for some really gusty winds, winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour, some hail, and also some strong tornadoes. We're going to watch this closely throughout the day. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Appreciate sure. it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.